Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the third in our series of webinars on early grade reading program design and implementation, best practices and resources for success. The webinar is presented by Reading Within Reach in collaboration with the Global Reading Network um, throughout the month of July, and also we had a webinar in June. Um, this webinar series is uh, supported by the U.S. Agency for International Development and implemented by a university research company, or URC. REACH supports the Global Reading Network, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with. Um, REACH develops and shares research, innovations, and resources related to early grade reading programming, working very closely with the members of the community of practice to hear about what they're doing and to get their um, input on our resources and all of our training materials that we're producing. Um, if you're not already familiar with a lot of those resources um, and opportunities for professional development, please take time after the webinar to go to globalreadingnetwork.net. You'll see we've re revamped the website a bit, so there's a lot of new content up there that we hope will be useful to all of you who are engaging in work right now to improve early grade reading, uh, early grade reading outcomes. The presenters of the webinar are myself, Allison Flepson. I'm the REACH Reading Program Specialist um, based at the URC office right outside of Washington, D.C. We also have Amy Palangio, a REACH Technical Advisor, who is based in Tanzania and will be joining us today. Arthur Limo is our Training and Curriculum Specialist. Many of you may have seen him on various webinars related to the Global Book Alliance, related to copyright and open licensing. We recently had some webinars on and also materials development. He was a presenter for that webinar last week. And today we also have joining us Adrian Barnes from Florida State University. So we will introduce them shortly. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, we just wanted to provide a quick overview of the series, the webinar series, and the purpose and what we hope to get out of it. Um, we are looking to provide uh, all of you who've joined us with evidence-based information, guidance, and resources to support the design and implementation of effective early grade reading initiatives. Um, each session is focused on a key technical topic and includes a summary of research, experiences from different countries, and best practices to date. So we've heard a lot from you and various colleagues about what they're doing, and we're hoping to provide now a synthesis of that to people who are in the depth of designing and implementing and expanding their early grade reading programs. We're going to touch on a lot of cross-cutting issues that we know are important to the success of our programs and that are also the priorities of the U.S. government and USAID as part of its new education policies. Those include gender equity, issues related to technology, and how we're making our programs inclusive of all learners and their different needs. Throughout the different webinars, we're also touching on issues related to monitoring and evaluation. Um, we're also thinking about how programs are expanding to reach um, entire countries in many cases, and how they're also looking at how they can sustain programs and how governments can become self-reliant to continue the good work that has begun. We know that the, by virtue of the m m webinar medium, it can be uh, difficult always to facilitate the discussion, but we have provided many opportunities for interaction and questions throughout each webinar. Um, feel free to engage as much as possible and share questions and your experiences. Um, our experience from the past webinars is that we have had quite a lively discussion through the chat and we'll be pausing at many points throughout the webinar to respond directly to the questions and issues that you bring up. So here's just a recap of the webinar series. Um, we've already explored early grade reading program um, issues from conception to scale. We looked at the USAID, new, the USAID new education policies and various issues that that has brought up in terms of where early grade reading programs will be going in the future. Last week, we talked about resources for teaching and learning. It was a really comprehensive overview of the different kinds of resources what makes for effective resources, and I think most valuable to many of the people was the discussion of the process of developing resources and how can we continue to improve that process and produce quality materials. So those um, webinar resources are now available on the GRN website if you weren't, um, if you didn't participate 
you can click on the tools and training tab at the top and you can download the presentation and all the handouts uh, from that webinar. So today we're moving on to talk about early grade reading skills and strategies for effective instruction and assessment. We know that this is a really technical topic that people have a lot of questions and are eager to learn all about the different skills um, that we're teaching and learning from, as Adrian will talk about, from phonemic awareness to reading comprehension. And what are those effective strategies that we know we should be using in our programs and, of course, adapting to the context and language. So we hope you will find it um, really uh, engaging and informative for your programs. Uh, next week, we'll be diving into a discussion on language issues. We've also heard from people that language is such a critical aspect across early grade reading programs from materials development to the skills that are being taught. And so we're going to take a deep dive into that next week. And then we'll wrap up the series on July 30th, exploring teacher professional development, including coaching, another topic that we know programs are really eager to hear what others are doing, what are some of those good practices, and where are those areas that we can continue to improve. So if you haven't already registered, please go to the website and you can click on the events page and see the registration link. So I'd like now to introduce our two uh, wonderful panelists today. Um, our lead presenter is Adrienne Barnes. Um, she's a literacy and pedagogy specialist at the Learning Systems Institute at Florida State University. She has more than 17 years of experience working in education and conducting education resource in American schools, as well as in the international settings. She currently provides technical support to several early grade reading improvement initiatives in Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as Central America. Dr. Barnes has been collaborating with REACH and the Global Reading Network um, to develop and deliver professional development related to early grade reading programs targeted both at implementing partners, governments, and USAID personnel. Prior to her international work, Dr. Barnes was an elementary school teacher. She received her master's and doctoral degrees from Florida State University in 2011 and 2015, where she was also a fellow with the Florida Center for Reading Research. Uh, Dr. Barnes will be joined by Amy Palangio. Amy has more than 25 years of experience working in education, program development, and international and program implementation with a focus on literacy, integrated programming, government capacity building, and cross-cutting issues. She's based in Tanzania, where she works as an independent education consultant. Amy first assumed her role as a GRN technical consultant in 2016 and she served in a similar role for organizations including Creative Associates, the International Literacy Association, the Global Center for Learning and Inter Innovation and World Learning. And she's been a technical advisor in many countries on US government reading programs, including Mozambique, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Kenya, Nepal, and the Philippines. Um, Amy was previously a vice president of US-based educational professional development organization called the Collaborative for Teaching and Learning, and she was also a literacy assessment specialist with measured progress. She has a master of education as a clinical reading specialist and a bachelor of education uh, in K-12 education and arts education. So we're very happy to have both Adrian and Amy with us today to take your questions and to lead our discussion about early grade reading skills and strategies for effective instruction and assessment. So I'm going to turn the presentation now over to Adrian. Welcome, Adrian. Thank you and good morning. Um, so the objective of today's webinar really is so that throughout this process and by the end that we're all able to know and discuss effective skills, strategies, and approaches um, for teaching early grade reading, uh, writing, reading, literacy, to understand how teachers can use classroom-based assessment to inform instruction, and to consider, make considerations for planning, implementing, monitoring, and evaluation, evaluating the instruction that's included in our programs. Throughout this time, um, if you would like to share your questions and comments, please do. There will be someone monitoring the chat box throughout the whole webinar. If you submit them to, the, to all, all panelists and attendees in the Zoom chat box, other people will be able to respond and our team of panelists will be able to respond as well. Okay, let's jump into section one, reading and writing skills to teach and learn in the early grades. 
there was a, a set of handouts that was sent out of, uh, two days ago, I think. And then I believe they were uploaded this morning to a Dropbox folder. If you don't already have those handouts as we start moving forward, go ahead and get those handouts downloaded and readily accessible so we can talk to them, talk to them and about them as we move forward. What are the key skills to teach and learn in the early grades? Well, research has shown that there are a set of skills that are necessary for children to learn. And although language specific conditions or considerations may influence how some of these skills are taught and how much time is spent teaching them, these skills are what make effective early grade reading or early grade literacy program. We need children to learn language skills, concepts of print, phonological awareness. They need to learn about the alphabetic principle through phonics instruction, spelling instruction, they need to develop their vocabulary, their reading fluency skills. They need to understand how to comprehend and how to monitor their comprehend, comprehension, as well as how to write and use writing as a tool to build comprehension. Handout one has a summary of all the skills that we will be discussing. So if you need a quick definition or you're not familiar with any of those terms, um, you can reference handout one. All of these skills work together to support literacy development and instruction in all of the skills is critical across languages. It's important for program designers to enlist the support of people who are knowledgeable not only about the language but also familiar with these key skills so that they can identify the most effective ways that the skills can be taught for that particular language and context. Instruction. The term instruction it includes all of the learning activities that teachers use, as well as the ways that teachers support students in discovering knowledge and learning skills. Because we are not pushing knowledge into children, but we are teaching them how to find the knowledge and how to discover the skills themselves. So, research indicates that students who fall behind in reading skills in the early grades continue to be behind. If they do not catch up, they do not catch up, pardon me. Um, in fact, they fall further behind with each passing year. This is referred to as the Matthew effect, where the rich get richer and the poor stay poor. The children who learn good skills early on continue to grow and grow at a faster rate than those who do not get good quality skills as they're learning to read early on. Why is this important? Because as, as each year passes, those two groups of children grow further and further apart. And the ones who do not receive effective early grade instruction continue to fall behind and their chance of catching up gets less and less with each, each year that passes. So it's really important that we start strong and we provide a good first teaching. Those early years are based on effective research, effective um, instructional strategies, what we know are global best practices for how children learn how to read. So let's move into the first activity. When you think about early grade reading, what teaching and learning strategies have you used or seen incorporated into different reading programs? I'd like you to take a moment to reflect and use the Zoom chat window to just share your experiences and ideas. If you haven't worked in, a, in an early grade reading program, or you haven't worked in any of these types of programs and you're brand new to the field, what skills do you think would be important? Or um, what teaching strategies or learning strategies? And please make sure that you send your responses to all panelists and attendees. Okay, Amy says this morning she saw a lesson that used review of sounds with motions and songs, and then blending real and nonsense words. So the sounds with motions and songs, it's really great to get children moving because we learn when we're moving. Um, and that introduction of sounds and songs is an introduction of phonological awareness, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, blending real and nonsense words. Some people question, why do you have nonsense words or should we be teaching nonsense words? And from my personal perspective, I think that we need to teach real words, but nonsense words are used really to assess whether children know what to do, whether they, whether they have um, the phonological and phonemic awareness skills, and then later the phonics skills 
to be able to apply blending and segmenting to create words that they might not be able to read. Um, so Linda says songs and rhymes, great. Stories, of course. Ali, clapping the syllables, okay, good. Playing with blocks. So playing with blocks, what are we doing with blocks in the sense of literacy, right? What can you do with blocks in the sense of literacy? Um, you can use them to represent sounds, like if you're sounding out a word, the word man, m, a, n, you can use a block to represent each sound, then you eventually replace that with letters, um, letter blocks, okay, clapping to segment syllab syllables, right. Um, most of what everyone has listed has been based on phonological awareness activities, which is great because um, I think that some people forget that those phonological, those early phonological awareness activities are extremely important for the later development of phonics skills. <clears throat> so it's good to see some people um, coming up with those activities. Okay, questioning, creating questions, asking questions, creating questions and asking questions. Questioning is a great way for students to begin monitoring their own comprehension and working together to monitor one another's comprehension to delve deeper um, because they have to be able to understand part of the text to be able to come up with a good question for the text. Okay. Um, Amy says multiple rereading of common text linked to the idea of creating our own questions. Awesome. And then, and then also like writing that's related to text, right? When we come up with good questions and we answer questions that are related to that text, that builds comprehension strong, strongly as well. So let's first talk about language skills, right? Language develop, development begins very early in life while children are still at home and, chil and children begin school with very different levels of oral language skills. So research has shown that a child's language skills when they start school is a very strong predictor of their, their reading comprehension. And so, that, so teachers, when they have children come in that have low language skills, they need to be able to develop that language. Um, it helps the child know what to expect, right? Because if a child can converse in a narrative setting, then they, they can read and understand in a narrative context. Children learn language structure through speaking and listening, and this helps them know what kind of word, like a noun or a verb, an adjective or a preposition, to expect as they're reading, like in the, the next word in the sentence. In this way, our readers unknowingly predict the upcoming words. Experience with language helps familiarize readers with types of language structures, such as stories and poems, the things that they'll encounter in written text. Therefore, children who experience rich, complex language throughout their early years are more able to understand complex reading texts. The more experience children have listening to and interacting with mature speakers of the language, the stronger their receptive vocabulary will be, which will prepare them for reading acti activities. And so teachers can provide a language rich classroom where there are many opportunities to talk in large and small group settings, where there are opportunities to engage in higher level thinking through questioning, where children explain and discuss the meanings of words. Teachers can use like shared book reading beyond grade one. Um, as a classroom teacher, I did shared book reading through elementary school and even upper elementary school and middle school and high school. It's about developing thinking skills um, through listening to texts and then responding. Um, but we want to build background knowledge. We want to support storytelling. And we want to support and scaffold students' responses. If they answer with a very brief or, or uh, simple answer, we can ask them to restate with elaboration. We can request clarification. We can provide encouragement and feedback. Let's take a, a look at handout number two. This is language instruction examples um, in, from the NEI Plus Nigeria uh, primary grade two English program. Now the students that are in this program that are, that are engaging in this activity are not going to be fluent English speakers. So this is a way for them to start practicing their English, uh, practicing their language skills through interaction. Um, 
And so the teacher would use this and then start building on that with maybe a couple more questions or a couple more activities. Now, USAID is currently finalizing an expressive language module that has several subtasks. <clears throat> that has a receptive language subtask that um, where the learner will point to pictures um, to that describe something that they're hearing or that that per, excuse me that uh, are is a picture of something that they're hearing. There's also a vocabulary subtask where the pupil will name items or describe situations that they see in a picture. And then there's a story retell subtask where the learner retells short stories and provides a moral for each. Um, my understanding is that this expressive language module is still like in testing and that USAID may be able to release it soon. So that's something to keep an eye out for uh, upcoming. And so language also um, applies to language also applies to sign language. Um, even if children are deaf or hard of hearing and they're using sign language, we still want to give them the opportunity to develop their language skills in the classroom. Students actually have to be taught how books and print work. They don't automatically know. They learn by watching their parents or their teachers or receiving explicit instruction. Teachers should teach explicitly text directionality for the language of instruction particularly when there are competing languages um, which have two different styles of directionality. Uh, concepts of print overall refers to a child's knowledge about how books work, what text is, how texts and books are organized. And as mature readers, we often forget that young children need to learn these concepts. Uh, since reading, unlike language development, is not automatically developed, learning these concepts of print is essential for beginning readers. The purpose of print. Young readers must learn that the story information is not in the pictures, but is in the words on the page. That print carries a meaning and that the text tells the story. How print works. Emerging readers need explicit instruction that text is read in a specific direction, that there are individual words and spaces, capital and lowercase letters, and that a sentence continues until there's a punctuation mark what the meaning of those punctuation marks are, etc. Now, I'm not talking about grammar instruction, but rather a roadmap for how to use print. It's particularly important when the print representing the home language and the language of instruction have different text directionalities. For example, English, Spanish, Hausa, French, and Amharic are all left to right, starting at the top of the page and progressing to the bottom. However, languages exist with other text directionalities, like uh, Amharic, Hebrew, and Syriac start at the right and progress to the left. Children also need to know how books work. They must learn how to hold a book, how to turn the pages one at a time, where the front and back covers are, what information the title, the author, and the illustrator provide. A child's awareness of print at the initial developmental step is their beginning of learning how to read. Let's take a look at handout number three. Handout number three has three teaching scripts on how to teach concepts of print. And um, we'll get into it a little bit later, uh, the three stages of the teaching process, the I do, the we do, and the you do. The teacher will first model the skill. Then under the we do, the teacher will practice the skill with the children so that they can um, receive support and scaffolding. And then the you do is where the teacher allows the children to exhibit the skill on their own and provide feedback if the children are showing any mistakes or anything. So those are some three, three scripts if you wanna take a look at those, um, just to kind of give you an idea of how to teach those three major concepts. Now the next slide will, is just kind of an overview of uh, text directionality, like I was talking about earlier. On the left, we see Chinese. We have top to bottom and left to right with Chinese symbols. We have Amharic left to right and top to bottom with symbols. French left to right and top to bottom with letters. And then Arabic right to left and top to bottom with letters. So when we have two directionalities or two types of print like symbols and letters or from right to left, left to right, 
and children are learning both of those, it's extremely important that teachers provide specific, explicit instruction in text directionality and concepts of print. So phonological and phonemic awareness. Phonological awareness is that awareness of the sound structure of a language. It's the ability to hear, identify, produce, and work with the sounds in a language. This is completely aural and oral. So it's ears and mouth. Um, and the children need to, do need to master this to learn to read and spell. Um, they have to learn that, sh that language is made up of individual words and that it's not just a stream. And then within those words are individual sounds. Weaknesses in phonological awareness can lead to reading failure. However, proper instruction and early reading skills can support the majority of young children who are at risk for reading problems, leaving only two to 6% of children who do not respond to high quality instruction. So when children are not able to decode and they're they are struggling to learn to read, this is where we fall back and we automatically assess how is their phonological and phonemic awareness. Because if they don't have phonemic awareness or phonological awareness, they are severely at risk to, for reading failure. Phonemic awareness is a very specific type of phonological awareness. Phonemic awareness is awareness of the individual sounds in words. It supports an understanding of the alphabetic principle, but it's not necessary in every single language. Because in languages such as Amharic, where it's syllabic and each grapheme represents a syllable, Children only need to be phonologically aware down to the syllable level because that's the level at which they will be decoding. So being aware of the structure of the language is going to impact, that structure of the language is going to impact the type of instruction that teachers will want to give students in the early years. And if, then again, if you have two competing languages that children are learning and one is syllabic and one is alphabetic, then they will have to get down to the individual phoneme level in their phonemic awareness for the, for the alphabetic language. Now, let's take a look at handout four. Remember that phonological awareness activities do not have any letters. There's no printed text. There's only pictures and sounds. So um, let's look at handout four. Handout four, you can do a scavenger hunt that sh you know, for items that have three sounds, right? Because you're counting the sounds. You can clap the sounds. You can use counters, um, boxes and counters. Those are, those are called Elkonin boxes or sound boxes. Um, you can do a read aloud and have children find the words that rhyme that really sh kind of shows what I'm talking about when we're looking at um, how to get children to become more aware. And um, I looked for one of the videos from the resources that were sent from around the world, but I just couldn't find one that really captured this skill the way that this video from America does. So pardon me for using an American video, but it, it's the skill that I want you to see. Okay, boys and girls, today we are going to play a game. We're going to be reviewing all the fun things we've been learning about sounds in words. And today we're going to play a game, and we're going to pick out some objects, and we're going to count the sounds that we hear in those objects, okay? I'm going to do it first, and I want you to watch me, okay? And then you're going to do it, okay? Okay. All right, we're going to look in here. If not looking, we're going to dig down in here and find something. <gasps> Oh, I got a log. Say it with me. Log. log. Now let's count the sounds we hear. Log. Wonderful. Very good. We had three, so I'm going to put it over here in our three basket. Okay? Let's have Shannon come up here. Have a seat in our seat. Dig down in there and find something. Get something quickly. What did you get? A dog. Let's say it with her. Dog. dog. Let's sound it, count the sounds. Dog. How many? Three. three. Can you put it in our three basket? Very good. Thank you. Okay, let's have Jemiah. Dig down in there and find something. What did you get? Lion. Lion. Let's say it with her. Lion. Lion. Let's sound, count the sounds. Lion. Four. 
put in our four basket. That was tricky. That was a little tricky. Austin, come up here and pick something. No. What'd you get? Nest. Let's say it with him. Ready? Nest. nest. Let's count it. Nest. Four. Put it in our four basket. Today's activity that we did was isolating sounds, which is very important for phonemic awareness. Um, this activity they can do together um, as a whole group, or they can do it by themselves in a center. This activity is hands-on, and the kids really enjoy doing this activity with their friends and centers. Phonics and the alphabetic principle. So phonics is an instructional method to teach the alphabetic principle. Phonics is instruction to build those decoding and encoding skills. So once children are phonemically aware and they can say, oh, the, the word log has three sounds. They're o, a, g. We can say, okay, well, the letter that represents that first sound, o, is the letter L. It's very important to teach both the letter name and the letter sound because the letter name is L, but the sound is O. Every time you come across that letter in a word, you don't say L, you say O. This is a really interesting concept for children to learn. And if they have a good grasp of the letter's name and the letter sound, then they're better prepared to be decoding. We also want to begin instruction with the most frequently used sounds and letters in the language. It doesn't mean that we're changing the order of the alphabet, but the, the goal is for children to start reading and writing as fast as we can get them reading and writing. And if we teach them a couple of vowels and the most frequent consonants, then they can start reading and writing short two and three sound words. And the idea is that they're applying the skills as soon as they learn them. They don't have to learn the alphabet A to Z before they can learn to spell any letters or words, excuse me, any words. So we want to teach them the most frequently used letters and sounds in the language. And we want to take letters like B and D that look and sound very familiar or very similarly. We don't want to teach them the same week. We want to teach them a few weeks apart so that they really understand one of those letters and then they can identify it and differentiate it from the other one that looks very similar. Um, if we look at handout five, well, handout five is just alphabet charts, just some examples of how you can introduce uh, letter sounds and, and animals and such, and it's in a few different languages. But um, handout six are phonics instruction examples. And some of these are pulled from um, P1 and P3, Hausa and English from the Nigeria NEI Plus curricula. And so you can see that we've got, you've got the picture to the left, right? And then you've got the word to the right. So they're, they, typically you're gonna wanna do several pictures with the same letter that starts at the same letter or the same pattern. So down at the, at the bottom, we have the word pattern at. We have at, cat, rat, fat, mat, sat, hat, and bat. And so we wanna teach children the letter sounds, and then we also wanna teach them word families and sight words. Teachers need to do this with explicit instruction. And um, will you press one more? There's, a, I think, a little note that comes up. We, time, time reading connected text. <clears throat> so we want teachers to use decodable text. Decoding means taking, going from letters to sounds and reading. Right, whereas encoding means going from sounds and writing it down into text. We want children to have decodable text, which means that they have text that only includes the phonic patterns that they've learned previously or that they're learning in that lesson so that they can apply the skills that they're learning right then. We want them to engage in decodable text and spend time reading connected text, not just lists of words, but connected text to build those phonics skills. So let's take a moment. All of these skills that we've talked about so far, oral language, concepts of print, phonological or phonemic awareness, phonics, how have you seen them integrated into early grade curricula? Can you provide specific examples of how these skills are taught in a program with which you are familiar? 
Can you, you know, just kind of give us some insight in what you've seen as far as this goes? And if you could um, address your comments to all panelists and attendees. English decoding of tricky words. Um, so something that uh, I'd like to say for English is, you know, a lot of people say, well, English has a lot of silent letters. If we don't teach them as silent letters, but we teach them as alternate spelling patterns for the sound, um, then children have a better idea and they're not so afraid of these silent letters that are kind of come up and, and uh, get them as they're reading. Um, but we do, have, we do have a lot of alternate spelling patterns that includes letters that are not um, spoken when you say that spelling pattern. So that's interesting. Songs and rhymes are really good for teaching most of that. Uh, teaching letters that sound similarly in different weeks, yes. So yes, C and Z, D and T and B, all of those letters that sound the same or when they look the same, like the B and the D look very, very similar. You wanna make sure that those are taught in different weeks. Call response of sounds. Pointing to, do you mean pointing to the word or the letter while the class calls out the sound, call response of sounds? Um, Christina, letter or group of letters. Okay, yeah, that's great. And you could focus on spelling patterns, on word families, um, or even like when you introduce that second letter that either looks or sounds similar to the first letter, you can, you can make sure that you're doing some back and forth, making sure that they're responding correctly to each of those. Circling letters that have the same sounds, mm -hmm. letter patterns, great. Or finding words that, that contain the similar sound in different places in the word. Um, word play games. Right, children, children really like games with word families. Um, any kind of, I mean, you know, because we all do. We, we learn best when we're enjoying ourselves, when we're relaxed, when we're moving, when the anxiety is low, when the tension is low, that's when we, when we learn. So any types of games that we can engage the children in um, with their learning is going to help them learn more. I love that the NAI Plus stuff, and I, and I know that other curricula did this as well, but getting the songs in and, and like, you know, teaching the children the, the songs. M says, mm, 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 and I don't speak Hausa, so I can't uh, tell you what the rest of that says, but um, I, thought, I think that's really great when we engage the kids in learning and, and, and singing and moving their bodies, because that's, that's how our brain works best. So... Spelling is, spelling is interesting, right? Because um, some teachers feel that spelling lists should be those words that the children are trying to learn, like for their science or for their social studies. But spelling lists are about word patterns, right? We want to present spelling lists systematically. We want to incorporate words from their reading lesson, lessons. We create spelling lists by grouping sounds or syllables or spelling patterns like money, many, and penny. Spelling lists are about learning patterns and do not necessarily include the vocabulary words for the week. We wanna provide students with frequent practice of writing those words, use maybe word cards for word activities with students like sorting or organizing or analyzing. We can encourage students to find the new word in their environment. They can use their own word study notebooks and personal dictionaries. We can also use word walls so students can see words that they often misspell. Because, I mean, you can take the word wall down when they do their spelling test, but we want them to be using those words and accessing those words as much as possible to get those spelling patterns into their neural pathways. We want to introduce a spelling pattern by choosing words for the students and study those common patterns. We want to encourage students to discover the pattern in their own reading and encourage them to write using new words. We can use reinforcement activities to help students relate the pattern to previously acquired word writing knowledge. Um, incorporate words from their reading lessons. We want them to use words in the environment. Words, 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 and we want them practicing and thinking about how they're spelled. 
So how is spelling different than vocabulary? Well, when we're working on vocabulary, these are not necessarily the words that we want children to be able to spell. They're the words that we want children to be able to use in their oral language, in their discussions. If they're writing it, if they're putting it in their writing, great. We don't mark them off for not being able to spell a complex word. We celebrate the fact that they wanna use that complex word in their writing. And so when we let them know that mistakes are okay and that they can use complex words without, being, without losing marks on their paper, then they'll be able to experiment and they'll want to impress you with the great big words that they know and that they can use. When we introduce new words to children, we wanna use child-friendly definitions, which means we use our definition contains words that they already know, and it does not contain the target word. So I wouldn't say, well, an automobile is an automobile that you get into to go places, right? we would use words that the child would already know. It's something that carries people from one place to another. The graphic organizer on the top right is called the Freyer model. Um, it's, it's a really good way to provide an overview of a word. So on the top left, it's what is it? An automobile is something that carries people from one place to another. What is it like? It has wheels and doors, a windshield, seats, and a steering wheel. And at the bottom, we have examples and non-examples. Examples are a van, a car, and a bus. Non-examples are interesting. A plane, a boat, and a motorcycle. Because a plane, a boat, and a motorcycle, well, they carry people from one place to another, and they may have wheels or doors, a windshield, seats, and a steering wheel, but there's something about them that makes them not an automobile. There's something distinct about them that makes them a non-example, but they're so close, it allows children to see, okay, these things are very, very similar to an automobile, but they are not automobiles because there's something that makes them different. We wanna conduct writing activities that involve using, using those new vocabulary words. Um, before reading stories, we pre-teach the meanings of important words. We review words. Like I said, we can create word walls for spelling and for vocabulary. Um, we can teach multiple uses for words and we can teach related words, synonyms, antonyms, or similar concepts to degrees. Along the bottom, you see a list of words, big, large, huge, giant, enormous. You can give the children all of these words that mean similar things and tell them work in a group and decide what's the smallest one of those and what's the biggest one of those? Or if they're temperatures, what's the coldest and what's the warmest? And the point is not really for them to get them into this exact list because you might not agree with me. Huge might be smaller than large or giant might be bigger than enormous. But it's not about making sure that the list is correct. It's about getting the children talking about the words and talking about what those words mean to them. Because when they internalize it, when they own it, then they have that vocabulary as their own to use. The next slide shows some excellent pictures of examples of how teachers can integrate displays of vocabulary trees and word walls in the classroom for students to see and use those words in their discussions, in their reading activities, in their writing activities. And remember that these words are for expanding word knowledge, right? They're not always, they don't always have to be for spelling practice. They can be like the word tree, all the different words that are related to one another. You know, spelling practice and word patterns are important as well. So you could do, you could do word walls and trees for both of those. Um, Allison said, you might want to consider a portable word wall that can be brought out during a lesson. So, yeah, and, and some teachers say, well, you know, I've got 150 children in the classroom and I can't put anything up on the walls. Well, you bring yourself to the classroom each day. You can carry a little something to set up that's got the words set up on it. Um, you know, I, I think that, that, that getting away from the idea that we just walk in empty handed as teachers, I know that myself and many, many of the teachers that I know, we carried a whole crate of stuff with us every day. And the more materials that we can create and use and display in the classroom while we are teaching, the more benefit our students will have by experiencing those resources. 
Okay, uh, any questions, comments on word spelling and vocabulary? You can put your word cards in transparent bottles and tie bottles with a string. That is a really great idea, Lydia, thank you. Um, empty water bottles are available everywhere. Yes, they are. And then tie the bottles with a string and like hang them. That would be really lovely. That would be quite lovely. And I'm sure that you could come up with some activities for that. Maybe have the bottles in a bag and then you choose a bottle and then you talk about what that, what that word means or how you would use it or, or what that spelling pattern, other words with that spelling pattern. You could get pretty, um, get pretty creative with that. Thanks for the, for the water bottle idea. Okay, um, so, all right, children have started learning how to decode, right? We've got them learning how to decode, we've got their vocabulary building, we've got them working with text, they're working with decodable text. Now it's time to start building their fluency, right? The A number one thing that I cannot say enough times is that memorizing is not reading. If you put a sentence on the board and the children read the sentence all week long and by the end of the week, they can read that sentence without even looking at it. Oh, they can read. No, they can memorize. They should have their fingers and eyes on the text while reading and have many opportunities to read. It is not bad for a child to have their finger on the word while they're reading. It is not bad practice for an adult to have their finger on the word while they're reading. I hear that many times. Oh, it's a bad reader. You can't have your finger on the text. I do it. If I'm being, if I'm in a loud environment and I'm being distracted and I'm trying to focus, I put my finger on the text because it keeps my, it shows my brain where it needs to focus. Children should have their fingers and their eyes on the text. If the teacher is reading to the students, the, the students are not learning how to read, right? If the children are reading and, the, and they're looking up at the walls and they're looking at the board and they're saying the same thing quarrelly with the whole class, they're not reading. They have to be looking at the words. Their fingers have to be on the words and their eyes have to be on the words, right? So ideally, we teach a phonics pattern. We allow the children practice and then we give them a passage and they sound out the words in the passage together. If a teacher's not sure whether or not the child is reading or memorizing, he or she can randomly assess that child, isolated words, point to an isolated word or an isolated sentence and say, read that word. And if the child gives you the whole sentence, they're not reading, they've memorized that sentence, right? Which means we have to go back. Or you could say, okay, read this sentence, but read, read it backwards. Read the last word first and read that sentence backwards to me. And then you'll know whether or not the children are actually reading. Um, let's take a look at handout seven. This is a couple of examples of fluency instruction from teacher's guides. The first one is from Egypt. Uh, the second one is from Nigeria. So um, we have the uh, four types of fluency instruction done, done together are echo reading, where the children repeat what the teacher reads. Um, choral reading, where the teacher and the children read together partner reading where two children read together or they take turns reading, and whisper reading where, I guess that one can be done by themselves um, or in pairs, where they read very low, with a lo very low voice in a whisper and they read the text together. Um, for partner reading, we can have children take turns. For whisper reading, um, so what some, some teachers in America have done, have gone and gotten um, some PVC pipe. Uh, it depends on whether or not it's available locally, but particularly with those very early readers, you get a little piece of PVC pipe and they hold it up to their, their mouth like a phone, one end at their ear and one end at their mouth, and they're whisper reading, and they can hear themselves, even in a loud classroom, they can hear themselves reading and they can hear the sounds that they're making as they're sounding out those words. And it gives the brain immediate feedback so they'll know whether they're doing it right and they'll hear themselves if they make mistakes. Uh, the second example was getting ready to read together. So, um, okay, the, the second example goes into some fluency instruction because at the beginning it's a discussion about what is a full stop and what does it mean when you come across a full stop, what do you do, right? I stop, I pause when I'm speaking. It would be difficult to understand me if I didn't pause, right? It's the same for reading. 
So a, pa a, a full stop tells us to pause for a moment and think about that sentence and before we go on to the next idea. So uh, fluency instruction includes instruction in those um, commas and hyphens and, and how to parse sentences and, and how, to, how to group phrases. And it also includes practice on how to continue building words and reading words. The trick is that fluency instruction and fluency practice is not really done with lists of words. It's done with connected texts. I mean, you can practice lists of words, but really when the rubber meets the road, the children have to be able to read connected text or they're not gonna be able to read at all. Decodable text, we discussed that earlier. This is curricular text that um, only use the phonics patterns and sight words that the students have already learned. So let's jump into another activity. There is no doctor in the village to help her. Kofi says that when he grows up, he will be a doctor. He will help people who are sick like mother. Fatty also wants to be a doctor. She will teach mothers and children to be healthy. Mother's mother smiles. She is happy with both of her children. A, I, B, N, A, O, K, E, E, O, E, N, A, K, N, H, I, T, A, N, B, S, N, S, N, L, G, D, K, L, U, H, Good, toss, make, hand, cast, yeah. E. Yes. B. N. Yes. O. E. B, C, D. Channel. Channel. Oh my. Channel. 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 Is Kaju less the way to less Kaju and Kaju is and daughter less is less it.
19 14 25 36 59 so um, if you had a chance to look at the videos for the first two minutes um, reader one represented 2% of the country's primary grade readers in Ghana, was able to fluently read the passage with no errors and with intonation that sounded like speaking. Next, he quickly provided the sounds for a list of letters and finally he read a list of non-words. Um, this child most likely understood the story, right? Because he was able to accurately re -re read the words with appropriate speed and intonation. This indicates an understanding of the text. But what do we notice about the second student? Do you think he, the, oh, what was the assessor saying? The assessor was, in the second video, the assessor was telling the student to just go on to the next word. Because during the EGRA, if they're not able to read that word, the assessor tells them to skip and move on. And they get about three seconds per word. And if they can't even attempt to sound it out, they're just told to move on to the next one. Um, the second student, right, could not identify letters and sounds, um, provided incorrect answers for a lot of them, and then unable to sound out any non-words. Um, he attempts to read a passage, but is only able to read the word in correctly. Um, so if the child's not able to add, identify any of the words in the story, is he gonna, going to understand any of the text? No. Um, even if the child is able to slowly sound out a few words, the attention that is going to be dedicated to sounding out the words is going to pull away from any possible attention that he could, that he could put towards understanding the message. So even if the child could maybe slowly sound out some of those words, the understanding would still be poor. So this pr video provides an excellent example for showing parents, teachers, and colleagues the difference between fluent and non-fluent readers. When we're building understanding, we're not able to do any skill. We're not able to apply any skill to text unless we can first apply it to language. So listening comprehension is extremely important with children. It's the ability to listen to and understand text that's read aloud by a parent a teacher or a peer, right? Because comprehension is the goal of listening, comprehension and being able to respond. Students have to orally practice listening comprehension before they can practice reading comprehension. It's the same types of skills. Like remember when we talked about phonemic awareness, you talk about the sounds in a word, log, l, a, g, and then when you apply letters, you say log is the letters L, O, and G, right? Listening comprehension and reading comprehension are very similar because children need to be able to listen to a story and then recall, recall the story in total, talk about details, predict events, analyze problems and solutions within that story, and respond to questions about the text because when they can do that with read aloud stories, then they'll be able to, they'll, they'll be more prepared to be able to do it with re stories that they read themselves with written text. Listening comprehension skills include all of the skills that a child must be able to do with text. So teachers should use read aloud stories to model and provide explicit instruction in all of these skills. Then they can move on to reading comprehension. Reading comprehension is the ability to read and understand connected text. Comprehension is the goal of reading. If the child is not comprehending, then they are not reading. They can word call all day long, but if they do not understand the message behind the text that they are reading, then technically they're not reading. That's the whole purpose. That's the end goal. Their understanding is influenced by their skills. What prior knowledge do they bring to the reading activity? What prior experiences, what reading experiences, 
What vocabulary skills? What words do they know? Once they know how to read words, they need to be taught how to predict based on what they already know, how to understand vocabulary within the context of this story, how to monitor their own comprehension and reread and apply fix-up strategies when they need to, how to identify sequences, causes, effects, and comparisons. This is the essence of reading. Oftentimes we forget that comprehension takes effort. We, we forget and we don't, we don't appreciate that there are very complex skills required for understanding a text. So we need to build prior knowledge, experience, and vocabulary before introducing texts. But this process is both inter interactive and strategic. Their phonological and phonemic awareness, their phonic skills, their fluency, all of those build, as well as their vocabulary, the reading strategies, how they construct meaning from the text. Because a reader must actively analyze text, internalize what has been read, and create their own understanding of it. If we take a look at handout eight, this is a couple of pages, and it's some examples in a couple of different languages of listening, listening comprehension and reading comprehension instruction. And I left this as a, a single handout instead of splitting it across the two slides because I'd like you to see how listening comprehension and reading comprehension activities are very, very similar, right? You read the story and then you ask some questions and then they discuss maybe what they liked or didn't like about the story. Will you do the same thing when the children are reading the story themselves? We ask them to read the, read the story and then we ask different types of questions. We wanna ask questions that the answer is right there in the text, they can point to it. Yep, what, what, who went for a walk with Nana? You can point to the name of the character who went for a walk with Nana. You also want to engage them in questions where they have to take information from different parts of the story and uh, c come together. And so like, how would you describe the Denwake? Well, you have to use different, different parts of the story to come up with a full description. But then you also want students to have to uh, answer questions that where the answer is in themselves and they have to justify it. Do you think that Nana made a good decision in the story? Or do you think her, act her behavior was appropriate socially and why? Was she, is, is Nana a good, is, it, is she a good girl? Does she behave poorly? Why? Because when they own those answers and they have to justify those answers, it means that they're really thinking deeply about the story. Um, so yeah, you've got some examples. Um, and then the last one, the third example, um, specifically says review the sight words, right? Talk about the sight words. Sight words are words that the children might not be able to sound out. They might not have the phonics patterns yet to sound those words out. Um, but we want them to be able to know what those words are when they come across them in the story. So when I talked earlier about pre-teaching vocabulary words, pre-teaching the difficult words, we want to pre-teach that before we give them a passage, particularly if those words are very, very important to the meaning of the story. So some people say, oh, you, you know, text structure is way too difficult to teach with children. You know, you can't talk to them about setting and plot and characters and or, or like facts and organization, but you'd be very surprised. So teachers can begin with oral discussion of the parts of stories and, uh, and informational text, right? So stories, narratives, and informational text to build listening comprehension. And this, this picture of these two gloves, I used, gloved in, I used gloves in my classroom. I use them in my trainings. Every time I do a training with teachers or teacher educators at the colleges of education, or even just working with a team to write curriculum, I show them the gloves. And I say, this is a really easy way. And they're easy to make. They don't have to look like this. You can take some simple gardening gloves that you find. I found some in uh, Bauchi State, Northern Nigeria for, you know, 100 Naira, which isn't very much money at all, and took a marker and wrote the words on the, on the fingers. <clears throat> but you start doing it orally, right? So on the left-hand side, you can see the narrative story. You get children talking about who are the characters in the story? Uh, what is the setting? Where did it take place? What was the problem? What was the solution? 
What were the events in the stories? What was my favorite part? What was the main idea or the theme? And then alternatively with informational text, <clears throat> you can have them identify three facts. What's the topic? What's something else that I wonder about this? What's something that I learned that surprised me? Because when they can do it orally, then they can do it with text. They can read text. You can do it with them listening comprehension, then they can read a story and they can identify those things. Then they can begin building their own graphic organizers to pull information from the story and summarize what they've read. When they start working on graphic organizers and responding to text and writing, that supports both their reading comprehension skills and their writing comprehension or their writing skills. Because reading and writing are integrate, integrate, excuse me, intimately related. They're fully integrated. The better you read, the better you will write. The better you write, the better you will read. We want children to have all of those skills. So let's move on and talk about writing for a moment. Writing supports reading. Students who practice encoding. Encoding is going from sounds that we hear or speak to words written down, whereas decoding is going from the written word and turning it into sound. Students who practice encoding are better at decoding, right? Because the two skills feed each other. We want children to begin writing as soon as they can form letters. So they don't need to learn the whole alphabet before they can start writing words, right? Remember when we talked about, we teach the most frequent sounds, the most frequent words, or the most frequent sounds and letters so that they can begin writing the most frequent words. And they wanna know words that apply to them. They wanna know their name. They wanna know mom. They wanna know dad. They wanna know family and sister and food and home. Those really common words, those are the words that we begin teaching. We begin getting them writing immediately. Um, and I want to note, say that, you know, handwriting is important. Early grade instruction should include time and strategies for teaching handwriting so that children can learn those appropriate and most efficient ways to form the graphemes, those letters or symbols that are used to depict the language. However, it's self-expression through the written process that supports comprehension, not copying activities, not writing, handwriting exercises. Those don't build comprehension. Those don't build reading comprehension skills. It's the self-expression. It's the getting their own ideas, their experiences, their responses to learning by using that writing process. Um, in the early grades, primary one and primary two, it's mostly brainstorming and maybe drafting a story and then guided revising and editing. But once they hit P3 and through P6, we're gonna see more of the conferencing and revising. We're gonna see them work harder and work a little more on each of those pieces that they write. And then you're gonna see publishing. Um, in P1 to P2, you don't really see much publishing. You might publish or you know have one final pretty copy of something once or twice a year for display but it's really about getting them writing, getting them writing the words, the sentences, their thoughts, their feelings, their experiences, critical thinking. Um, the transition from handwriting lessons to expressing ideas should happen very early. As soon as they're able to write letters, they should be encouraged to write their ideas and summarize learning activities, even if they're spelling it wrong, even if they're only writing two letters for a word, but they can tell you what that means to them. That's written expression. We wanna get them writing as soon as we can. Even though handwriting is not perfect, the student is making the learning activity more concrete by putting their idea into writing. Advice for writing instruction in large classes where it's difficult to give a lot of personal attention. For example, one teacher to 100 students. Um, I think it helps to have, when you have very large classes like that, if you can group them into smaller groups of say five to 10, actually probably around five, and have them work together to come up with a text together and make sure that each child is contributing something. And then when they have a text together, they can create their own text in their own notebook. Um, you can also provide maybe um, some scaffolding where you either give them a topic or you give them a sentence and tell them, hey, this is a sentence about what we learned. Now add more to it to make it more elaborate to ex express more of what you learned. Um, yeah, and Amy's saying model it, modeled writing is a good strategy. Um, and Amy will talk more about um, 
the gradual release model um, in the next section. But modeled writing and, and really modeled is the first step of any type of instruction. But you move from modeled writing to a series of different types of guided writing where you're stepping away and allowing the children to work together and work in pairs, maybe giving feedback um, as far as to the group or to individually. I think in a large class size of, you know, 100, you definitely have to um, triage, right? So you have to look for what are the students who need the most support and make sure that you're giving them feedback first or um, maybe looking for those who are exhibiting the lowest levels of skills. But I think really we, we, want, we want them essentially to get the experience. So I also think that one thing that te many teachers think is that they have to grade everything. Everything has to be a grade. It doesn't. It, it, it can be experience. It can be the children practicing. And you can use it as formative assessment, going through and looking to see, okay, these are the kids that are able to write this and, and they're doing pretty well. Maybe I'll work with them on developing ideas more. However, these kids are having difficulty even getting any ideas on paper. Right. So these are the kids that I really need to talk to them about how to get your ideas on paper. What are, what are the thoughts in your brain and how do you get them onto the paper? And if you if you want to email me personally afterwards, we could have a really good conversation about that, Eunice. So let's move on to the next activity, actually. So activity three is um, what is something new that you've learned so far in this next section? Right. Um, actually, in all of this section, because this is we're coming to the end of section one and um, Amy will take over for, for section two. How can you apply any of this new knowledge or strategies to a program that you're currently working on? Um, please discuss not only what you know, but also share any experiences about what you've seen in the field or lessons learned that can help others as they take on the challenge that we're all taking on of designing or implementing instruction. Um, I look forward to seeing your thoughts and your reflections on this. Okay, so uh, Christina says that confirmation of practical strategies and key principles, especially of reading and writing, reinforcing each other, great. Uh, students should begin to write their ideas as soon as they can form the letters. Yes, thank you for taking that away. Um, teaching children basic peer review. Yes, so having children interact, having children learn to review and provide feedback to one another is a really great way. Muhammad says the issue of introdu introduction and teaching beginning with oral discussion of the part of the stories is the key strategy we're adopting. That's wonderful to hear. Yeah, because children need to be able to, do, to use a skill orally before they can use it in reading activities, right? So thank you, um, uh, Lydia. Children want to, we want them to write as soon as, as soon as they can form letters, right? Because if, if you wait till they have, go through all of grade one, you wait till they have written all the letters before they do any writing, they're not going to remember what they learned in the beginning. We want them to be using it and building that knowledge as they go. Okay, examples of skills development of different countries. Great. Uh, Dipti, there, we can also probably provide you some more examples if you need them. Thanks, Christina, about making sure that we're trying to address that early writing. Uh, random assessment, right? Isolated words, isolated sentences, that's great. So the idea of having group writing activities before individual writing also helps children understand what's expected of them when they go to individual writing so that their individual activities are more efficient and they're not wasting time. I know that huge class size is, is a huge problem Class sizes is a problem, so which makes it really, really important that teachers know what they're doing. They have good classroom management skills and they can spot those kids that need the extra support as soon as possible. All right, so um, but just to start saving a little bit of time, um, we're gonna go ahead and move on and let Amy go ahead and present the second section of the webinar on effective instruction for teaching and learning. No. Yeah, effective instruction for teaching and learning early grade reading skills. Thank you, Adrian. Um, and so this is the section where we kind of pull together all of the skill sets that Adrian has done such a really comprehensive job of helping to take you through um, and some of the strategies. And so how do teachers really take their understanding of the specific skills 
children need to have, how they develop those skills, and then link them to the kinds of strategies that we know are effective with young learners. If we bring it up to a bit of a larger level, what we're really talking about is the overall instructional approach. Next slide. So when we talk about instruction, we like to talk about structured pedagogy. Structured pedagogy really being um, a well-planned instructional approach that is patterned, that is repeated, um, that helps teachers to control for things like instructional time, um, a systematic approach. This is this issue of scope and sequence, introducing skills in a particular order. Explicit instruction, you heard Adrian say many, many times, students need to know exactly what it is that's expected of them. Um, getting instructional routines in place. Again, this is really an issue of making sure children are empowered and time is not wasted in the classroom. Scaffolding, that's that support for children as they move toward independent learning. And then making good decisions and good decisions in the classroom are assessment informed decisions, never guessing about what it is that children need next. All of these five principles really kind of wrapped into a social emotional supportive learning environment where children feel safe, they feel safe to take risks, they feel safe to try new skills, make mistakes. And we had a participant reference earlier the importance of having children make and reflect on their mistakes. So we're going to be going through each of these six principles in a little more depth. But I also want to refer you to a relatively new REACH resource, and it's listed there on the screen, Promoting Successful Literacy Acquisition Through Structured Pedagogy. This is a new paper from Young Sook Kim and Marsha Davidson, um, just produced through REACH and GRN a few months ago, and you'll find it very valuable. So I suggest highly that you take a look at that document and download it for your own reading. So when we talk about maximizing instructional time, um, in developing countries, the, the preferred number of hours for instructional time for the academic year is really 1,000 hours. And this comes out to about five and a half hours of instruction, five days a week. Um, but for those of us who work in developing contexts, we know that this kind of gold standard is fairly rarely achieved. Uh, because even when students are in school five days a week and the school day is five and a half to six hours long, a lot of that time may not be being spent on instruction. And so we have to really make a distinction between the allocated time, the instructional time, and the engaged time. Allocated time is the time that the government really has formally through policy and practice set aside for teaching in schools. Um, out of that allocated time, only a certain portion of that is usually dedicated to real instruction. Uh, and then inside the instructional time, there is yet a smaller bundle of truly engaged time, the time that students are really focused on teaching and learning tasks um, and really engaged in learning. And this is critical, maximizing instructional time is really critical for early grades literacy. It's this issue of eyes on print and time to read. Students need extended time for reading. So when we have teachers who find themselves with 20 minutes three times a week to teach reading, a good portion of that is on distinct skill sets, it can really, um, real reading and time to read print can really be done a disservice. Um, and in many low income countries, we really find that children are not being given enough time to learn to read effectively. It's just not happening. So if we look at this one example, this is an example of allocated versus instructional versus engaged time. And this particular example starts with 630 hours of allocated instruction. And you can see in looking at it that just pulling out the kinds of things that interrupt instructional time takes the instructional time down to 239 hours. That's less than 50% of what is originally allocated. And inside that 239 hours, all subject areas must be taught. So we run into real difficulty continuing to maintain and safeguard time 
for early skills development. There's a number of ways that different governments are addressing this problem. Um, and a lot of the principles we're going to address in this, in this section of the webinar will help to address that problem. But also many countries are choosing to really focus in early grades, grades one and two particularly, on a limited number of subject areas and on really intensively building those early skills. So it's around social development, it's around early numeracy, it's around early literacy. So if you think about your own project, and if you have ever done an analysis of the allocated time by government versus the real instructional time allocated in the school, and then time in classrooms to observe how much of that instructional time is actually engaged time for children, it's critical for you to know those patterns inside the context within which you're working, because it influences um, your scope and sequence, it influences how quickly you believe children can work their way through learning letters and the associated sounds. How often should reading be taught? Is it better to cluster reading into larger chunks of time, fewer days a week, spread it out over a number of days a week or every day a week? Um, how can you separate it from language instruction? So if there is a, a dedicated and required language class, does reading get subsumed there? If it does, skills don't get developed the way that they should. Um, also, what about review days or revision days and the concept of continuous assessment? How do we manage the time in the classroom as effectively as possible to make sure as much of that time as we can get our hands on is used for early literacy development? Big critical issue. So this issue of systematic and in explicit instruction, we talk about systematic and explicit instruction in, um, in a single phrase usually as if they're the same thing and they actually are not. Um, so we wanna kind of break them out a little bit here. They're partners and they're critical partners, but they are not uh, the same thing. So when we talk about systematic instruction, this is this issue that's a language specific issue and a, and a national curriculum specific issue of sequencing lessons so that the skills inside that particular language of instruction are taught in a logical way, in a way that gives children access as early as possible. It goes to Adrian's earlier discussion about teaching the small cluster of letters that are most frequently seen in simple language so children can begin reading as quickly as possible, they can begin decoding as quickly as possible and writing words as quickly as possible. And that comes, of course, in almost all countries now in a document from the government or from a program if it's not available through the government called the scope and the sequence. Scope being the depth and breadth of what's going to be taught and the sequence being the order in which it is taught. Um, explicit instruction is connected to this, but again, as I said, it's not the same thing. This is this issue of teachers being very direct to say to students, this is what you are learning, and to model the skills and the strategies so that children are not confused. It's paced at a proper pace through the scope and sequence. It's introduced in a proper order through the scope and sequence, and it is addressed explicitly in the classroom. You have a handout, handout 10. This is an example of a scope and sequence. We're not going to pull it up or discuss it now because I'm watching our time for the last part of this webinar, but I encourage you to take a look at it. There's a lot of examples out there available now. Um, and I know GRN actually has multiple examples of scope and sequence. Some of the best scope and sequence you can find are those that take into account the kinds of things discussed in the in principle one, which is this issue of time available for instruction and how to pattern and structure that time and pace. So instructional routines. These are the simple things teachers can put in place in their classroom so that children know how to move quickly into an activity or from one activity to another. It also assists teachers in being organized and clear on what they're doing. A lot of times um, in training teachers, teachers are interested in getting their hands on as many instructional strategies and as many instructional routines as possible. And that actually doesn't work in their favor with young children and it doesn't work in the favor of the children either. Young children like patterned and repeated routines. They like patterned and repeated 
activities. It helps them feel secure. It helps them feel confident. It's also helpful in making sure they can access new skills or new information. Young children are unable to learn a new skill at the same time they're applying a new process. So when we're introducing new information or new skills, we should be using already established routines during introduction of new concepts. So you can see here on the screen also some suggested phases of routines. So students should always know that teachers are going to refer back or review the previous material that was just covered. This should happen not only as a part of the pattern and routine, but it helps to link children into their prior knowledge. Then presenting new materials, new skills, new strategies or information. Modeling, and we talked about modeling as a part of the writing discussion. Teachers model before students practice, time for practice, and then teachers giving feedback. The routine also needs to integrate regular review. Now, this is also a decision that should be made based on context, based on time and pattern of instruction. Should review be done weekly, uh, every two weeks, monthly? Sometimes those decisions are different based on the breadth of a particular set of study or curriculum that's being addressed in the classroom. These are all decisions that are context specific. So that was pretty quick, but we're going to pause and just think about it. Have you seen a structured pedagogical approach in early grades programs where you see those patterned routines? You see that tight emphasis on explicit instruction, very ordered and very structured presentation of information. If you have, we'd like to hear about it. Um, and then can you give us any ideas for specific routines? Uh, that you know of that improve instruction in early grades. And we will pause for just a minute and wait for some ideas. So Dipti is talking about putting students into groups, naming those groups, and even inside the grouping, having roles and responsibilities that are common or shared. Um, so when students need access to certain materials or they're going into certain kinds of activities, we would be surprised at how young and how early students can and actually wish to take on those kinds of responsibilities. Um, Ayala also mentioned about structured pedagogical routines that are repeated every two days. So working in a two day cluster and repeating that kind of cluster process over a, two, a, a set of two days. So two days, two days, and I would bet that, that uh, in that case that the fifth day might actually be for review of what has been learned during those two day sets. Yep, that's exactly what she has let us know. Friday is for review. I've seen a lot of two, two and one structures. I've also seen four and one structures. Um, these days you very rarely see a set structure and routine linked to a scope and sequence that doesn't provide for review at least once a week. And, and I would, we would recommend that review at least once a week for students. Okay, I think I'm gonna go ahead and move this on just for the sake of time. So scaffolding. Um, and Adrian referenced earlier the I do, we do, you do kind of a gradual release methodology. So this is another example of that I do, we do, you do. The teacher models something new for students, a skill or a process or a strategy, an approach. That is the I do process. I'm showing the student how, doing the modeling. So the student is being shown, the teacher is doing the showing, and then working together teachers working with children. This is where you might have students also working in groups if you're dealing with large class size or it's a particular approach that is friendly for groups and effective in group work. So this is where the teacher helps the student. We do this together. It's also called guided practice. Well, first before Amy was going over it, how, you know, first the teacher models the behavior or the behavior, the skill, um, and then provides guidance as the students learn it. The practicing provides feedback. Oh, a problem. This is the most problem they've had. Then the, then the children um, move to begin using the skill independently with feedback and guidance. And then 
Eventually, the teacher helps students to complete and learn to complete more and more complex, complex tasks independently. So principle five is about making assessment informed instructional decisions, right? In this picture, the teacher is assessing students skills by having them write in the air. By doing this, she can see which students are able to write correctly and which students need additional instruction. High quality instruction addresses the content and the skills that students are ready to learn. This means that teachers should be aware of what the students already know and what they're ready to learn. Teachers learn this by assessing students using the assessment data and using the assessment data to determine what topics and skills the class should focus on. Assessment is more than just testing. Assessment is evaluating student progress, skills, and knowledge. Um, using formative assessment like this teacher is doing in the picture um, allows this, the teacher to get a really general idea about what students can do and what they cannot do. Like when I was talking earlier about how with large classrooms, it's really important for teachers to be able to go in and quickly assess who has the skills and who needs more skills, who needs more instruction. This is what guides instruction is that that rapid formative assessment that we do in the classroom. It helps them identify what skills need to be reviewed, monitor progress, use data to guide instruction, demonstrate the effectiveness of instruction, and gather information on how instruction can be improved. Um, there's a forthcoming resource by the REACH and GRN about assessment to inform instruction, which will thoroughly describe different types of formative assessments that can be used in a variety of contexts, key assessment areas for early grade reading, and formative assessment tools. When we talk about assessment, there are two main types, formative assessment and summative assessment. Formative assessment is when the knowledge is still being formed. It, we use that assessment to guide instruction, to change instruction. It lets the teacher know which students are succeeding and which students need additional support. It's how we evaluate student learning, and it's part of the I do, we do, you do, particularly the we do and you do parts of the lesson. Summative assessment is an evaluation of student learning that's conducted after all learning has taken place. The results of the summative assessments do not impact teaching. This is typically an exam, a test, or a performance. And I really love this quote here um, by Robert Stake because it, it uh, my mother was a chef, so I love to cook. So it really, it really feeds into my belief and my perspective of the world. When the cook tastes the soup, that's formative. When the guests taste the soup, that's summative. Because once you've served it, once you've done it, it's done. You can't change it. But if you assess while you're teaching and you use that information to change what you're doing, to continue to form that knowledge in the children's brains, and in their skill level, then you can impact the outcome at the end. Uh, the next principle, uh, fostering socio-emotional learning. You know, learning occurs best when children are comfortable, when they're socially engaged in learning, when they're in a positive environment, they feel good, they have pleasant conversations, when they're excited about what they're learning. And we want teachers to be aware of children's needs, moods, interests, and abilities and then use that awareness to guide their interactions with children. This is a resource um, by the Interagency Network for Education and Emergencies, um, and the download, you can download it at that link. Um, it's a guidance note on how to facilitate psychosocial well-being and social and emotional um, learning. Let's go to the next slide. Part of fostering socio-emotional learning is making sure that we're providing an inclusive environment that provides instruction and supports to all students. Um, these are two really great resources that are included. Every, resources you've, every resource you've seen so far is included in the list of resources for this webinar. Um, but teachers need to know to assess and intervene when necessary. They should be teaching that they should be providing a teaching that is inclusive of children with disabilities and gender equitable and providing socio-emotional learning activities, particularly for students who've gone through trauma or for schools and teachers that are in conflict areas. Um, those teachers might need special training on methods to help children overcome trauma and how to feel safe in the classroom. 
There's also a paper out, um, it just came out recently by Ben Piper and colleagues, it's in the, in the reference list, called Measuring Literacy Outcomes for the Blind and for the Deaf, Nationally Representative Results from Kenya. So there is, there are, there is research, there are re re resources out there um, to really address this inclusion. And August 22nd to the 23rd, the Universal Design for Learning Toolkit in-person training will be held in Washington, D.C. Uh, through the Global Reading Network. And um, Allison and colleagues will be releasing that registration information soon. So this is a resource towards the design and implementation of comprehensive primary grade literacy and numeracy programs. Um, this is a resource designed to support the design and implementation of math and reading programs. It really addresses synergies um, and the unique characteristics of literacy and numeracy instruction. It's available for download at the GRN and it's included in the references and resources list. Before we, let, before we wrap up, let's talk very briefly about technology to support instruction. Because technology has the potential to assist teachers in improving their instruction in numerous ways. There are videos, mobile apps such as Papaya and HearScreen. Papaya is a phonological awareness application that helps children learn the sounds and, of the language. HearScreen is um, a hearing and vision screening application that can be used with smartphones to identify learners with disabilities. This has been piloted in Ethiopia. There are other software programs that can support teachers such as Tangerine Class and Stepping Stone. Um, links for all of these are included in the reference list. Um, has an example of ICT to, ins to support instruction for all children. The Ethiopia Read program developed this really interesting inclusive media, multimedia lesson plan that it included explicit guidance to teachers on how to adapt lessons for certain needs and audio files were included to support phonemic awareness instruction and, and story activities. Like I said, all of that information is going to be in your resource list. That's a really going to be a great, a great document for you to have. If you don't download any of the handouts, if there's one thing you want to download, it's going to be the reference list that has all of the resources and links for everything we've presented in this. But looking at this and wrapping it up, right, the key takeaways on early grade reading, there, there are skills that children need and effective instructional strategies for teaching them. There's a large body of evidence that provides guidance on effective instructional strategies for teaching early grade reading skills across languages, across contexts, across the world. Children progress through specific developmental reading stages, which should be reflected in the scope and sequence of the curriculum. And a good scope and sequence recognizes the psychological developmental progression of children as they move through different ages and as they experience different traumas and changes in their life. Classroom-based assessment is an essential component of instruction. Using formative assessment to determine what is taught is feeding what the, the children what they need and not following some cookie cutter lesson that today is day 27 of week such and such and we have to do this lesson this day and I cannot stray from it. That doesn't help children learn. Teaching them what they need to know is how we help them learn. Our instructional practices should be inclusive. They should provide equitable opportunities for girls, for children with disabilities, for children with specific needs, for socio-emotional learning, all of that. Um, we harbor love in our classrooms. We bring a wealth of knowledge. And our goal, our ultimate goal, is to help those children get as much as they can from the limited time that they can get with their teachers to become literate, to become uh, creative and critical thinkers, and to be great citizens of their countries. So thank you very much for your time. And I'll turn it over to Allison to wrap up. Thank you so much, Adrian, and also to Amy. Um, we hope you all found this informative and are able to take away some new ideas for your programs. Um, we apologize again for the audio and video challenges we had. I can assure you this has been a bit of an anomaly. We've actually had some um, great audio from Amy from Tanzania in the past and haven't had, had these audio glitches. So we'll make sure that we get those straightened out for the next time, for next week, when we have our session on language issues and early grade reading programs. 
Um, all of the session materials that were presented today, the handouts and the list of references and resources are currently in the Google Drive folder if you haven't checked that out already. But we are going to be um, removing that in the next day once we get them onto the GRN's website. As I mentioned, all of the materials from the past two webinars are there and you will get an email from the Global Reading Network um, account once that link is available. You'll also be getting uh, an evaluation, a, a very, very brief survey about this webinar. So if you can take a minute to fill that out, we do appreciate all your feedback. And you're, of course, welcome to contact us at any time. Here's Adrian and Amy's email addresses and also, of course, the Global Reading Network. We do monitor that email. So if you send us questions, we will get back to you. Um, I'd also like to encourage you to send in any sorts of materials, photos, um, interesting anecdotes from your experiences. As you saw throughout the presentation, we have photos from uh, programs. We have handouts with snapshots from materials or in the reference section links to full resources. So um, really, we want this to be a community of practice where people share. And those were all things that people shared with us and sent to us. So if your program has something you would like to share, don't hesitate to reach out. We also are happy to um, um, publish blogs. If you'd like to write a blog about something, um, we can uh, share with you the specifications for our blog. Um, you can see our colleagues here who are helping um, to run the webinar. We want to give them a shout out and thank them as well for their support. Um, the upcoming webinars are listed here on the screen if you haven't registered for them please do. Um, other webinars of interest, we just had one last week on open licensing of education materials. I wanted to highlight this again um, because it is such an important issue that we know many programs um, are dealing with. So please um, stay connected with us on social media if you aren't already. Um, you can connect with us also on LinkedIn. It's a great opportunity to see who else is working in the field of early grade reading and find people who might be able to support your projects through the Global Reading Network LinkedIn account. So thank you again to our presenters and we look forward to seeing you next week.